right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, let's jump right in. This is a webinar on Simulink Test. Now, in the past, we have uh, several recorded webinars that show you an introduction to Simulink Test. We also have some that show Simulink Test being used for real-time testing. But today, we're going to focus on desktop simulation, and we're going to show some example workflows around finding and fixing design errors using Simulink Test. I am Megan O'Neill from the technical marketing team uh, at MathWorks, and I'm joined here in the studio uh, by Craig. Do you want to introduce yourself, Craig? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Craig Borgasani. I work in the application engineering group. So my role is really very customer-facing related. So it's my job to listen to what the customers are saying and align our products with their development and design processes, and more importantly, get that information back to Megan so that she can help better guide the tool development with what's happening in the actual field. And today, I'm actually going to play actually as the customer. And so I think, Megan, you're going to be doing some interjecting. Exactly. As so I will, I'll be a bit of your guide. So I'll uh, help you along the way and provide some explanations as needed as we go through. Sound Fantastic. good? Fantastic. All right. Let's jump right in. Okay. So we'll show some, uh, these are the key points that we are going to talk about. First, we're going to do a bit of ad hoc testing. So we're going to build um, some functional tests. And to do that, we're going to isolate the component that we're interested in testing, and we're going to use the external harness capability in Simulink Test to do that. We are then going to author our tests using the test sequence block. That's how we will create our input vectors to stimulate the component and also create some assessments based off of our requirements. And then we'll go through the process of finding and fixing the error that we discover. Next, since the component that we're testing is coming from a library, we're going to want to push that harness back up into the library set. We've got a reusable test, a great starting point, a template for other people to use in other instances of that component. Then we're going to wrap up by looking at moving into the test manager. So we're going to take more of a systematic approach here at the end. Here we're going to create a test from the model, which will create our test case in the manager. And then we're also going to look at the capabilities that will allow us to build and execute iterations. We'll then review the results, including the coverage, and we'll generate a custom report. So that's our overall plan. Great. And this is the model that we'll be looking at. This is our custom model, so it's an autopilot. However, if you see here, we're going to focus on this role reference. Now, within an autopilot, we have the heading mode, and we've got a basic role mode, and then this role reference component. Now, the role reference component is very important because it's actually going to constrain the pilot from actually rolling the plane too great of an angle. So there's actually one of the key requirements in this role reference is that we don't exceed... 30 degrees roll. That would be uh, very uncomfortable. Flight. Yeah, horrible. And I've, I swear, I think, I think it's gone greater than 30 on some of my flights, but we'll see. And that's what our purpose here today is to build a test harness for this component. And just like Megan said in the prior slide, I'm going to actually go through all that. And like all of our other customers, we don't want to look at a lot of PowerPoints, so I'm going to right, dive let's right in. Move into okay. MATLAB. Now come into my model. So this is just like what we we're showing in the model. Now, again, we see here that my role reference is actually a library link. So let's kind of bring us back into, let's take a look at that, that block itself. So we see that there's my role reference inside of my library. And now from here, as Mago has mentioned, I really want to get going as quickly as possible. Now, we're going to get into more of a systematic approach later on, but I just want to get started. I want to build this, um, this uh, test harness around this. This came from another colleague of mine. And so, again, that's my task here is to build this test harness. I want to so. see if it's working right, a functional test based on a requirement, right? So you'll see here from the menu item that I can find my test harness, and I can quickly create a, a role reference test harness for myself. Now, the key here is it's going to give me a, a default name, which I'm fine with. And as Megan mentioned prior, we're going to make sure that this test harness lives externally. Right. And since you 
Haven't you don't have any harnesses right now in your model? It's going to give you this question whether you want to use external test harnesses. And when you select that option, when it creates the test harness, it's going to create it as a physically separate file. Uh, and the process of doing that, it won't dirty the 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 main model. So that's one advantage of selecting that um, external option. And this is key because in my world, I have version control, configuration management. Right. Uh, in prior releases, we used to store the test harness, and this was a big push by a number of our key customers to make this capability external. And so that's what we right now we give you that. now we give you that option. Right. And you'll see here that I have a number of uh, sources that can be come in. In this regard, I'm going to be building a test sequence block, but I right. don't know if there's some of these others that are kind of important to other customers because some people might like a signal builder. Absolutely. They may do things from, from workspace or from file. Just be aware that uh, we have those and, options. And right. if you don't see the option that you want here, you can always, uh, you have two, two choices. You can select the none and drag and drop from from the library just the way you would when you create um, models. Or you can do custom and insert the name of the source block that you want to use. So you're not restricted to just what you see in in the list, but these are the most common options that customers use. Right, so we'll select test sequence. We're also going to add a assessment block that's again going to assess our output signals. And then below here, we're now going to make sure that um, because remember, this is a find and fixing sort of workflow, workflow exercise. So I'm going to choose this refinement slash debugging right. option, and then everything else here I'm going to live with just the defaults. Right. And I'm going to ask that it open the harness after creation. And an important thing about the choice that you just made is it's going to allow us to make changes. We're going to still be able to edit that component under test, which is exactly what we want to do in this case. Yeah, and again, and remember, in this workflow, I received this autopilot from another colleague, but I have the ability to actually make some changes if I discover some problems. So we'll be definitely um, looking at that workflow here shortly. So I click OK, and here is my test harness with the various options that I selected. And we'll start to go into here shortly. OK. Now remember, I mentioned about the role reference, so it's going to be Thank you. I just press the space bar there to maximize the window so I can see all my components. Now, so we notice here that, you know, again, back in thinking about the role reference, we have this fee angle. All right. We also have the autopilot engage, and then we got the turn knob. So understanding more how this works, there's actually a knob in the cockpit that that pilot can turn. And again, remember, we don't want that. We don't want the capability to go beyond 30 degrees. Now, but however, we've got to build some test sequences right. inside this. And this is where inside Simply Test, what you're looking at are two of the key elements out of three. We'll touch on the third here shortly, which is the test manager. But we're looking at the test sequence block and the test assessment block. Now, the test sequence is really where I'm going to build my um, input vectors, input vectors right. through that. Now, what's interesting about this is these are not signals, I'm actually putting this in as steps that I'm going to set various values and then of course the test harness will take care of that to inject those signals into into my uh, component. Right. So if you drag down the editor just a little bit so folks can see the harness and uh, the editor at the same okay. time, a little bit of wayfinding, you can see on the left hand side of the test sequence block that the block is going to output fee our app engage and our turn knob and so you can see those are the signals that are going to come into our component under test on the harness and you can also see that the test sequence block is is receiving an input so you see the go to tags in the harness that's bringing that back in into the test sequence block so that way if you want to create dynamic tests for your inputs that's how it knows what the current output of that fee reference fantastic so now what I'm going to do is remember, I've got to put this through uh, a number of steps. You're noticing where we've got some nice um, highlights there to kind of give you some guidance when you first come into this. But what I want to do is I need to kind of exercise my fee, all right, to kind of push this through the limits that we're going to want for my testing. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to create, um, let's do set low fee. So I want to say a, a low fee angle, and we'll say... Now, what's interesting about this is I actually have completion on this. So I can do a tab complete 
much like inside our MATLAB window also. We do, we're being consistent here. And then I'm going to set this to be 4, so angle of 4. And then I'm going to come over here, and this is interesting here because I can actually add transitions. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually give myself a, a temporal transition, right? I'm going to say after. And you're noticing here that it's kind of recognizing the semantics. Or, so for those of you out there in state flow land, it also kind of does this stuff too, kind of recognize things and makes things a good color. Two, right. and then we'll do seconds. Okay. Now it's trying to guess where I want to go. Now, as I part to add more, I'll set these up. Obviously, we don't want to hop back to step one, but this is a very interesting uh, capability here that after a certain transition, we can control. So you can kind of get the idea of the flexibility of, of this interface already. That's right. Let's set up a straightforward example, which is uh, linear. Certainly, folks um, sometimes add. Uh, a lot more complexity. They want to have multiple transitions, which you can do and change the behavior. So there's a lot of capability with the test sequence block under the hood. It's state flow, and it gives you a lot of um, a lot of advantages to author these scenarios beyond just using time series data. Right. So now you're seeing here as I'm again as I move through these linear situations. So I've got to engage. So again, learning about this system, all right? So here we are setting a fee, kind of sending in our test signal for our component. And now we're going to engage low, that low value on the autopilot. We've got to kind of, the way this is going to work here, we've got to set it, and then we're going to kind of engage the autopilot so we recognize this low value of 4, all right? Because we don't really, again, remember, we don't want the um, either pilot or autopilot to be able to go past 30 degrees. So now here we're going to want to perform a, a reset to get us back to um, a value of like, let's get AP engaged. I want to get this back to false so, so that, off. right, so that I can then create my next, and we'll do transition here again after two seconds. And this is okay. it's similar in concept for uh, folks who maybe are not familiar with planes as much. I mean, it's similar to cruise control in your car in that you have to set a, a set point for the speed before you can actually engage the cruise control. That's so right. that's what you're really doing with your autopilot engage by turning it on and off is a similar concept. We're going to set the value and then we're going to engage it. Now, in this case, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm just going to ask it to do a true and then I'm going to now place again the same thing here I'm gonna do my engage high but you'll see shortly why I'm doing this um, okay so again like I mentioned here up oh, let's get back to okay. getting this to engage and so you're AP. choosing to um, you're choosing Set. to to create your own custom name so that first row uh, where you're overriding the, the generated name, you're giving your own customized name so it makes sense. Right. If you want it, I just want to point out that on the far right column, if you uh, wanted to give a description, uh, if you had a more complex scenario and you wanted to just put in some natural language to explain this step, you certainly could, could do that here. And that's useful for, um, for reviewers, for example, or if you need to pull it into a report. Yeah, so here I just added a description in that regard. And, uh, and, of course, that column, if you don't want, you can also hide it Correct. if you don't want it to be there. All right. So, again, there's a lot of newer functionality that's been put in here in the release 2016A that we're looking at here on the, on the uh, test sequence. And one thing to, to point out uh, also, we, we won't go ahead and dig into it, but you'll notice uh, maybe you just want to point to the icon where you can add the links to requirements. So if mm -hmm. you wanted to link requirements, you could highlight it, and you could link requirements to any or all of these rows if you wanted to, uh, to do that. Yeah, there's quite, a, there's quite a, again, the context is also here. So for those of you that like the right-click context menu, so as, as Meg is talking about. So again, this is, should look very similar to uh, a lot of you that have used our requirements link capability that has been around for many, many years and mostly lived inside of Simlink for a lot of those years. Correct. So let's now do, we have our input vectors set up. Let's do a save. Megan, I think what we'll do is we'll, because we're all, we love to press the play button. Mm -hmm. So I think inside the model, inside the harness, 
we are going to now want to concern ourselves with viewing these signals. Right. So. Right. So we have a couple options to do that. Uh, one uh, great option is to stream it. So let's go ahead and stream those signals to the data inspector. So when we run it, we'll be able to easily view the values of those signals. That's right. So I don't have to necessarily worry about the test assessment right now. Remember, right. I, you know, I'm a customer. I just want to get this going and get something started so I can um, see what happens. So, of course, we can press play from either the harness model or from the test sequence blocks. We'll press play here. And you should notice that it runs pretty quick. And we are going to get, you'll see the highlight change here for the simulation data inspector. And now inside of here, but what you're also noticing, I did forget because I am a customer. I and you were impatient. To... <laughs> I didn't want to stop you. I wanted to let you see it. But again, what this is showing us is we're still seeing the various um, outputs and inputs. This is obviously the text sequence that's coming out of the role reference block. So we know this is from our output. We can already see that we have that violation I mentioned happening, which we wanted, which we wanted to see. Okay. And then there are the various other test sequences here. You're seeing here that remember I set the the other the fee through a value of four and then of course to thirty point six. And of course what you're chuckling okay. about is it's showing you the port number, so test sequence one, two, right. three. Um, if we wanted to actually view some names that are maybe a little bit more user friendly, I think we should go ahead and uh, add great some labels idea. onto our signals. So let's do that. Let's autopilot engage. Let's do turn um, and feed ref. Now, if we had a more complex test, one thing to be aware of, if let's this time actually run it from the test okay. sequence block, you're going to notice that there is some uh, animation, which we can slow down. There's a little gauge if we want to just uh, maybe make it uh, medium or slow. And if we needed to add some breakpoints, we could do that. But let's actually run it and run straight through. So you'll see it'll give you some information. Uh, you can even highlight and see values as you go. So some, some important debugging capabilities. All right, nice. Now we'll come back to our model. And you'll see here, again, for those of you that aren't aware of the simulation data inspector, been around for a number of releases. But notice this, that it's keeping track of our various runs. And here now we start to see, you know, my true labels some of, friendly names yeah some friendly names fee and fee ref all right so this is going to be very important for us because what this is showing us already okay again is saying here you know remember i told you that my component my component in our test was not supposed to allow us to exceed 30 degrees that's right. one of the key requirements here inside of our inside of our model so again we don't want to make those passengers uh freaking out that's not a good and, thing and you're doing what you're demonstrating right now is really kind of what i would call an eyeball check you've right. you've looked at the graph and you're having to remember now in this case this is a pretty straightforward easy requirement but if you had to remember all of those requirements and how to visualize and say is this right or not that's where it kind of gets a bit tricky so let's take a look at actually authoring an assessment so you don't have to rely on your memory and your eyeball test to say whether or not the test is actually behaving Perfect. as passing. All right. So this is a use of the test sequence block to write the assessments. And so this is where uh, we're making a choice. We could write the assessments in the same block with the input vectors, but uh, it's a good practice to separate them out. Um, now this means that the assessments will be reusable. They'll be separated from our inputs. Great. So rather than me have to type too much, but I'm going to bring you back into MATLAB and I'm going to show you that where this requirement, and see, so you'll see here 1.3 hold reference. Okay. I'm really going to worry about this one. I'm uh, sorry, 1.3.2. So we set to 30 degrees, same direction as the actual roll angle. And this is where, you know, it should not exceed that is greater than actual rolling is greater than 30 degrees at the time. So I think there might be a little problem here that my colleague may have either missed during the requirements phase or whatnot. Again, this is the whole testing that we're going through. So if we look back at my model, looking at our component there, so this is our test harness. If we come back into here, all right, we'll see again, we're looking at our, our various signals. There's fee, 
But we don't want, you know, again, fee reference is coming out of our of our subsystem square, right? So fee ref is coming out. We don't want that to exceed 30 degrees. So so first, you want to author an assessment so we can verify that behavior and, and see the and uh, see it and then apply the fix. Sure. That's right. Exactly. So now we know more about the model and things like that. So this is our requirement. Let's so, actually author an I'm assessment. going to kind of cheat here and just copy this. Right. Okay. So you've already authored the, the verify. Right. So you're using the keyword verify, uh, which has a really important uh, behavior, which is something that a lot of customers ask for, which is that when it sees a violation of your verify, okay. it won't bring the simulation to to a halt the way it would if you use, for example, assert. Instead, verify will allow the simulation to keep running and it will tell you where in the simulation run it found a problem. All right, so now you see the verify that Megan was talking about. We're going to press save. And I just want to point out one thing, Craig, for folks yeah. who haven't uh, really used the test sequence block. So you're using what's called a when decomposition. So you've made a switch uh, essentially here. And so after the exceed positive limit, you have in blue a when statement. So it, this is telling you when this verify is even going to be active. So you've defined the when condition uh, for the verify that follows to actually be executed and checked. And for some of those that want to dive deeper into some of this stuff, we're going to see some of these other commands here, which are capabilities onto the verify command. I didn't necessarily have to do this, but what's nice about this is it will actually um, output when this actually happens. Exactly. So it will be like kind of a custom error message of sorts. You get a custom error message, and before that, the Simulink Verify High, we're going to see just as in the Simulink Data Inspector, it's going to give us a friendly name, uh, which will be make it nice and easy in the graphs. And this is in the documentation, can explain um, how to do that. So you could just write verify fee ref equals 30 and stop there. But the added benefit of adding what's in the, the purple color is you'll get some, some friendly names on the graphs and a custom error message. Yeah, so go ahead and, and execute this test. Well, that's right. We have the other test week kind of slowing things down for us. That's right. And so, you noticed um, the when statement wasn't active right away. So originally it was starting out in step uh, one, one underscore two. That's right. So, so let's take a look at yeah. the Simulink Data Inspector. All right. Here's our run three. And now you see our newer Verify High. Our Verify High. And that's the friendly name that we gave it. And not good. Well, so let's <laughs> let's uh, let's give a little bit of wayfinding. So first of all, if you haven't seen this before, you'll notice that there's three different values for the verify statements: untested, pass, and fail. So in the beginning, we saw that in the animation, it wasn't that when statement wasn't true, and so therefore it was untested. That was not applying at that point of the simulation. It wasn't only until we got to time step six here that then the when statement applied. And then at that point, it's going to give us either a return of a pass or a fail. And you see that from there on to the end of the simulation, it was failing. So, yes, yeah, so we've got a problem. And we could view, again, the, the signal data. That's showing it exceeding 30, which is what that verify right. check is doing. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So now, as I was pointing out, back in the component, kind of started to explain myself here about I've kind of got at least some knowledge of the component that my colleague was working on. And we've got, you know, this exceed that's happening. You know, we're kind of violating this. We're putting out a bad fee ref, essentially. So essentially the pilot that could be turning the knob potentially could put the, the plane into a, uh, a very steep roll. So now what we're going to do is come back into our model and now remember, this is living in a library. So my colleague kept this in a library so that we could have um, linked instances of this throughout other models so to save our headache if this is going to be used in other other areas. But what I have to do now is, if you low in the lower corner, it's something new in the, some of the later Simulink um, versions is I have to unlock this. So I get a nice display up here. You can disable this link now and restore later. So this is perfect. We're going to disable the link. And you need some way to constrain that signal so That's it's right. not going to exceed that 30. So here is really that ref switch. This is really the component, you know, I want to constrain that fee signal. So now some of you may or may not know, we actually have in-canvas editing now for Simulink. So I can actually get that search icon up and I can start to type. A saturation is really the block that I want to use to constrain that signal to certain ranges. So I put that in. 
And now I can drag and drop. And of course, Simlink has gotten smart about how it wants to add things to lines. And remember our requirement, nothing greater than 30 or minus 30 or negative 30. And now that's in my model. We'll leave it as is. Remember, this is still, this now is different than what's in the library. So I actually have this in the test situation here. But now it will come up. Okay, now again, I can rerun this test. But now I've applied the, uh, the change here. All right, let's so, confirm that fix. I mean, we think that that should fix it, should. but let's actually sure, verify I think it. it. Because I'm, I'm really good at this stuff. Of course <laughs> it fixed it. I believe it. you. I believe you, but I still want to see the I get it. I get it. So reruns. We again have our simulation data inspector. All right, we'll simulate. Hi, this is our run four. And now nice. we see that we get a pass. And so of you course, see the untested in the beginning again, and uh, because our stimulus has stayed the same, right? Our input vectors right. are the same. And here we see our fee and fee ref, you know, doing the kind of what the behavior that I would expect to see right around the time that we have our, our passing test. Right. Great. Okay. okay, so you've made the change to the component here in the harness. That's right. So every And you've confirmed that the fix works. Now let's talk about back in the main model and the library. Right. So now I've made this change, okay? And you're seeing here that this is disabled. Now within the harness, the way this has worked, because it's an external harness and some of the, well, just the harness in general, the technology here, I need to perform a save. I save the I harness. I to remind you of that. Thank you, you yes. And then yep. I close it. And now let's get back to my original model. And now you'll see, you'll notice here that this is still a disabled link. Right. Okay. Now the way that we should work this, right, if I click on that, there's my, there's this is a nice capability. Block, right, so that harness and the main model are, are synchronized. So that component under test that we saw in the harness, we could make the change there, or we could make the change here in the main model. Harnesses take care of that for us. They keep those uh, in sync. That's right. Now that I've confirmed that I passed that test, I can now utilize my library technology to resolve this link. And notice here, I get this nice dialog that's saying, okay, we're going to push this back up to, I don't think, yeah, I can't make this little. So you guys can see this, that there's the lib. This is going back to my lib, so I can say push all, click OK. Now what will happen is I'm back in my library, and, of course, I should hopefully see that I have my saturation okay. block, and now I've got Absolutely. my Absolutely, so now you've gotten up to date. Now your that's right. design model is right. So pretty much what I just did there is a way to quickly get into, you know, jumping in and building some a test sequence, a test assessment. Yes, I did one requirement. Obviously, this scales wonderfully for a lot more requirements. Right. This just want everybody to know this is actually a shipping demo. So there's a lot more involved here that we really couldn't go into um, for this webinar. But just be aware that this is a shipping demo, and you guys can access this in the Simulink test documentation on the example section. Right. If you want to get to, to this model and take a look at it, you can. So now that we've talked through that behavior, let's actually see it in action. Let's actually let's go ahead and delete our role reference block that we've got in our model and drag in a new instance from the library. Then we'll see the behavior okay of dragging in a new instance now that we've pushed that harness up. That's right. I want to stress, please notice that the badge is gone, right. meaning that that operation actually happens. We'll delete that. That, that harness got moved all together. It deleted it That's here. That's right. And now we'll drag this new one into our model. So now we have a new instance, and you'll notice that we've got now that new instance of role Save reference, it. and along with it came that test harness. Now, what came along was a copy so we got a new copy of the test harness, and this is test harness 2. And so um, we can go ahead and make any changes if we want to for that harness. This is an external harness, so we've got now two harnesses on our path, one that's in living in the library, and now a second copy, which is here a local copy. And that makes sense to you, right, Craig, because you could be changing? Correct. I could alter potentially data types exactly. or, you know, maybe virtual buses, who knows what might be feeding into that. And so I would have to change possibly the test sequence or even the um, test assessment block to support what I might be doing right. now with that right. The component, which of course is a linked instance to the reference block in the library. But of course the 
harness itself is, is depend, independent is of those. separate right. right so you won't have that synchronization there Correct. okay great so we have been um we've been testing this in the model that's right um which is fine that's a good workflow if you want to just check a couple of things you want to hit play a couple of times but let's try to get into a bit of a more systematic approach. Let's look at how you can automate some of these, uh, some of this behavior, and take a look at the advantages of using the test manager. So let's get away from just hitting run in our test harnesses and move over into that kind of testing. Correct. Now I believe I've got to. I want to get into more of the this form aspect. I think I have to expose some signals um, that we're logging. So I believe I've got to. Make certain that um, from what we have set up. You want to open up that harness again that we're going to use? That's right. I believe it's the harness model that we have to make certain that. Um, I think you actually have to open it again. Yeah, let's open yeah, it here. I don't think here. we opened it. Right. I know I have to get in here because exactly. we have our signals. Now, before these were streaming, all right, and these we were streaming. See those so again. let's make sure, let's just make sure these are streaming. Yeah, stream selected signals. Let's make sure that is there. Okay. And but let's then, check your data, simulate data inspector, um, the actual configuration. So yeah. if you click on that drop down, so, let's just double check the configure log and streaming that's right. options and right, sends those to the workspace. To the We're workspace. gonna I'm gonna want that. Okay. But yeah, now let's get into the test manager. Let's create a test file from uh, from the model. So you have an auto creation option here. Create a test file from the model. That's going to go in and inspect the model that you've selected. And if you um, want to, it's it's going to let you pick the test type. So we've talked about in previous webinars the different types. We're going to keep it basic right now and look at the simulation template type. That's going to fit well with our use case right Let's now. Let's create that. Yep. And now we'll move down through here so we can take a tour of what's happening here. Exactly. So now you have a test file with one test suite, and it found one harness in your model, so it created one That's simulation right. test. And let's just make sure, just confirm that, there's our test harness model. Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, let's minimize this. We don't need to look at that. Right. So now you have, uh, now what it did was it created a test case for you. It's got the model that you selected. It found, it inspected, found that test harness and selected that. Now you're done as far as uh, creating this test because your harness in this case is self-contained. It's got your input vectors and it has your assessment. So you don't need to create any additional inputs or anything else here. If you wanted to go and start changing behavior and overriding parameters and things like that, you could. But let's actually execute this test. Let's run it. This is going to be the same thing as if you hit run in the test harness. Well, let's get rid of uh, some of these results here. Yeah, those were your old old those results. Old ones, let's, yes. let's declutter. So you have now your new test results. Again, this is like hitting play in the harness. So you can click on that to view the same uh, visualization of the Simulink Data Inspector to see the verify. Since we streamed um, those results, we can also see our all of right. our signals of interest here exactly. in the test manager. Very convenient. Very so convenient. we had, we made that fix. So as we expected, this test is passing. Right. So now we talked about performing some additional testing. Right? right now, the inside test manager, we've got more of a kind of a systematic approach here that we can use to share with other people. So now, if we come back to our um, test case test, definition, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I talked about was maybe you've got some parameters that you want right. to and change. I happen to have some parameters. So let's go into the parameter override section and let's add a couple of parameters here that then we could. Do some, uh, some so I'm going to ask it to look at my workspace. So you need to refresh. refresh. Do a little That's arrow. A, yeah, that'll show you all your tunable parameters in Let's that are available. Ah. There we go. There you go. So what I have in the model is a max threshold for um, one of the inputs into that fee logic. Now, maybe I might want to do some other different values for these maximum thresholds that I have inside of my, my subsystem. So, of course, I can select these and click OK, and that gives me these two, but now I'd like to put some, this is more than just one set. Right. This is just parameter set one, 
but I'm going to add again, do this again, and I can do this kind of approach here. And I could. Re whoop. Now I think you wanted to uh, actually uh, create a second parameter. I did. Set. I did. I yeah. did. I did. So um, if you click Sorry. on the, that's okay. That's if good. You this is what I've got that, you here for. The, the the little drop down arrow. You're ah, going to add a second parameter Thank set. You. Thank this you. is going to allow us to create some some iterations. Nah, I perform my ad. Now we want to add that. And again, we're doing this in a manual way to show you the UI. Everything that you're doing can be done via the API. So um, if you have a lot of parameters to, um, to add in, you don't need to do this in a point and click fashion. Right. Now, let's actually create a couple of iterations because I want to try, I want to create some tests that look at both parameter sets. So an easy way to do that is to use the table iteration section. Now it has a nice auto generate feature. So if you click on auto generate uh, and we sure. want to iterate over parameter sets, we say, okay, it's going to show us now a table. It's created two different iterations and you can see in the first one, it's going to use the parameter set one and the second it'll use parameter set two. Now, if you wanted to do a lot of iterations or you want to do something that's not quite as straightforward, that's where we provided a scripted iteration section where you can add um, MATLAB code to actually uh, create your scripted iterations. You have a template button there, iteration template, where it can populate that uh, with a template that then you can modify. Uh, so right. you don't have to start from scratch. But if you let's just check. And this is again more upon that, that dropping that down, you'll see a lot of the kind of the, the guidance, yeah, the yeah. guidance and the hints that you're giving here for this section. Okay. Now I'd like you to actually show them the iterations. Okay. So we might have, um, you can actually cancel out of that oh, and sorry. click on the ah, show, show iterations, iterations button. Iterations. Yeah. So now you're going to actually see that we've got one test case that has two iterations. And we could mix and match. We could use table iterations and scripted. But especially if you're doing scripted, it's always a good idea to double check how many iterations did you actually create before you hit the execute. So we've got two, which is what we expected. So we can hit OK. And let's actually re-execute this test now and see what it looks like. All right. Let's run it. So you'll notice it has two results, right? Because we have two different iterations. We now have two different tests that just got executed. And we can see the results for both iteration one and for iteration two. That's right. So we can dive in. We'll still see a pass. Right. None of the values I selected really push the system to, to its maximum. But again, this is just another workflow example of, of doing that for so I have a component. question for you, Craig. How how well do you think you uh, you did your testing? How much of the model do you think you actually covered by this simple scenario? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Probably not all of it, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't definitely think so. Not definitely not all of it. Definitely well, let's not actually, all of it. Let's actually find out. So one nice uh, capability you have is we go back to our test case. Um, Let's go, let's set some coverage actually at the test file level so that for all right. of the test cases in this test file, if we um, go down to the bottom, we can set some coverage settings. And so let's click on record the coverage for this system under test. And, and let's yeah. look at I'm MCDC2. Want MCDC definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, definitely. So definitely. now all of the test cases in this test file will inherit this, uh, these coverage um, checks. Now, if we decide to go back and rerun, yeah, you can actually run at the I'm whole right test, test file yeah. level. That In this case, we only have the one test case. So, yeah, hit, hit run, execute this test. And now we'll see that in addition to getting the same results um, that we had before, yeah, it'll take a little bit longer because now it's, it's running right. the coverage. But it will show us our coverage results, and it will even show us our um, cumulative coverage if we had multiple tests. So we can actually look at that, um, that test, and there now we go. can see for that entire uh, suite of tests that had two different tests that executed, two different iterations, we can see now our cumulative coverage. And if we wanted to drill in and see the, um, the coverage for a particular iteration, we could see that. In this case, tuning the parameter, we won't see a difference. Right. So that's a really nice uh, capability now that, that we have. We can view that straight here in the test manager in the results. Let's actually go ahead and create, to wrap this up, let's actually go ahead and create a report. So we viewed artifacts. all of the, the visual, yeah. the okay. uh, results here. So why don't you go ahead and pick one of your results, maybe the, well, maybe the most recent one. Yeah, the most recent one. Right click exactly. on that and let's create a report. Okay. So we'll get the reporting dialog box. 
Now, you notice we have uh, right now it's saying it's only going to create it for failed tests. Well, you right. only have past tests, so let's go ahead and change that. So let's show um, all the past tests in our okay. case. Now you'll notice we can leave on. It's going to show us our the requirements coverage. For example, anything that we linked, we didn't link requirements to our test case. If we did, we could have that in the report. Now one nice option is instead of creating our our standard report, let's actually go ahead and create a customized report because. One thing I'd like to see is what the snapshot of the harness looked like. That's a okay. real common thing customers like to see. Yep. And so, I've got that. I've got that. I had to put a quick name here because, again, I didn't want to type too much. And now we can put that so in So this is going to refer to the custom so, report template that you created in the Simulink report generator tool using the new DOM API. That's right. So, so this is actually a report class inside a dot, a dot .matlab file yes, right. using the, the document object model. So again, look on that on the web. It's a great feature we've been doing has to a lot advance. It has a lot of power. So right. if you want to create these customized reports that maybe add in additional detail that the standard report didn't do. So go ahead and create, Let's hit create. It. And we'll just see an example. Again, this, this custom report's going to give us a snapshot of the test harness in our report, which is a common thing that people like to see. And we asked for a PDF. So that's our PDF format, but we also support Word. And HTML, HTML. right. You've got, you've got several right. different options. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we scroll down, so it starts to look like our, our standard report here. It gives us our summary of results, and then it will dig in to um, show you each of the um, each of the the iterations. And you saw the the coverage was included there. Um, yep. Now, now this is what we want to take section. a look at. This is one of the customized things we wanted to have a view of what harness was actually being tested. So we added a snapshot here in the report of that test harness. So that's what our our customization allowed us to do a lot exactly. of other things you can do you can be changing the, the the really the look and feel of this report you can change how uh, the graphs are made if you want to combine signals onto one graph or change the figures in other right. ways exactly great exactly. well now let's do a quick summary because we've gone through a number of things so if you flip back to PowerPoint let's just sure. wrap up with a summary of all the things that we Back went to through today. MATLAB. Oh wait. PowerPoint. There we go. Yeah. Let's take a look right. at what the key points are that we covered. So we looked at building functional tests and we did this in a bit of an ad hoc way. We isolated the component that we wanted to test, created an external harness for it. We authored some tests, both the input vectors and the assessments using the test sequence block. And we executed the test, and by doing that, we were able to discover and then go ahead and actually fix the error that we found. And then we went through the process of updating the library component. So we saw the change that we had in our instance updated in the library. We also pushed the newly created test harness up into the library. And we took a look at that behavior of actually creating a new instance and getting a copy of the test harness back into the model. We then switched into more of a systematic mode. So we went over to the test manager and we created some reusable test assets. So we created a test case from the model. We also took a look at building and executing iterations by iterating over a couple different parameter sets. We took a look at viewing the coverage analysis in the results. And then we went ahead and generated a custom report. So we covered a lot of topics. Again, some of our previous webinars dug into areas like the different test templates, some basics of the test sequence block. We also had looked at in previous webinars real-time testing. But now in this webinar, we've really focused on some of these core new capabilities of doing functional tests, both in the external harnesses as well as in the test manager. All right. We have a product page that you can take a look at. Those previous webinars are all available if you go to the webinar tab on the product. And this is where you can find out about key features that come out for each of our different versions of Simulink Test. So again, thanks a lot, Craig, for 
Megan, thank Taking you for your guidance. Journey. Yes, you see that mistakes do get made, but then this is all in simulation, and that's the that's the great thing about it. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for joining me, Craig, on taking a look at this example. And if folks have any questions, you can always reach out to us on the product page. You see, um, there's a link to email me directly with any questions. It was great working with you today. Yeah, I really enjoyed kind of going through the material with you and helping you kind of guide me as the customer might have to move through this. Exactly. So thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care.